So good morning. We always enjoy having you in. We're going to get going. Okay. Um, we'd like to hear what's going on with our labor force, and, and you are a person that, that, that can explain it very well. So, we enjoy having you. Great. Where are you going to take us today? Great. Thank you for having me. For the record, my name is Matthew Barrett, Economic and Labor Market Information Chief for the Vermont Department of Labor. Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. Uh, thank you so much for having me. Um, I appreciate the opportunity to come and speak about the overall economic conditions, and certainly if there's questions about the overall economic conditions, I'm happy to uh, field those to the best of my ability. Um, if I can't get you the answer today, I'll do my darndest to get you an answer in a timely fashion. Excuse me. Um, and uh, as it relates to um, any other questions regarding currently pending legislation, I'll certainly do my best to answer those. Uh, I think it's important just to recognize that uh, my position is apolitical. I'm a state employee, 100% federally funded by the Bureau of Labor Statistics and the Employment and Training Administration, both within the U.S. Department of Labor. So I'm here as an economist to provide information to help you make a decision uh, and overall give you an update on the, the status of the economy. So what we have here um, on this graph, just for a little reader guidance before everyone gets overwhelmed with colors and lines, is um, an economic trend. It's been put into percentage terms so that it is all relative. But left to right, what you're looking at is months, the number of months. And up to down is percent job loss or job gain. And so what this uh, chart is depicting is from the last peak of the last business cycle, which is December 2007, what has happened. Um, and so the green line represents Vermont. Uh, we included the blue line as well to represent the US. But in short, and we've had these conversations before, during the recession, during the depth of the recession, four out of every 100 jobs in the Vermont economy were lost. Conversely, six out of every 100 jobs in the US economy were lost. So you see the blue line goes lower than the green line. I don't know, would you prefer me to point? or? I'm kind of like pointing here. Yeah. It doesn't help anybody. <laughs> yeah, I mean, in some instances, yes, because those of us that are color efficient appreciate it. Sure. So the US uh, lost six out of every 100 jobs during the, the death of the recession. So this left to right is months, yeah. and then percent job loss or percent job gain. So Vermont was right here about four out of every 100. And then once we bottomed out, we had economic recovery. And so that's around 2000, the summer of 2010-ish. Um, and you can see that the U.S. economy started uh, increasing at a, or growing at a faster rate than Vermont, and that's customary. Just like we didn't get as low during the economic downturn, we don't get as hot during economic upturns. Um, can you just tell me what NECTA is? NECTA it is um, technically, um, in short, it's a metropolitan, metropolitan statistical in area, an MSA. Okay. Okay. New England technically doesn't have any MSAs because we're organized by towns. So that is New England <laughs> cities and towns areas is what it says. New England city town areas. So that's just showing basically Burlington's growth is just shot off compared to the rest of Vermont. Right. Yeah, and that's where I was going to go next. Oh, okay. um, Sorry. Yeah, no problem. No. That's, 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 that's where I was coming in. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> so basically my question, could, what can I exaggerate on that a little bit? Yes. <laughs> so, <laughs> so just, just Blasting into this right here, it looks like I'm looking at Burlington's economy, and then I'm looking at Hinterland's economy. And it substantiates everything I've been saying. Yay, Bob, good job, right? Not good, Bob. So, what makes this. Just a clarification. When you say Burlington, is that the city of Burlington or Chittenden County? Or the, I'm from Colchester. So. Yeah. So yeah, they're weird. Good. Everyone had their caffeine this morning, ready to go? Good. This is great. So if, when we look at the Vermont economy, we can break it down into two parts. We can break it down into the Burlington uh, labor market area, the, which is the Burlington South Burlington NECTA, which includes all the way up into Swanton, uh, the northern part of Addison County, um, not Waterbury. So kind of that way. So it represents basically the northwest uh, corner of the state. Including it, I mean, Colchester. Including Colchester. It definitely does. And St. Um, and St. Albans. And so it represents about 30 uh, about a third of the population of the state of Vermont, about 40% of the jobs in the state of Vermont. 
So this is what they consider the, you know, when they ter use the term economic engine of the state of Vermont, this is the area we're talking about. And labor market areas are defined by where people live, where people work, and where people shop, so commuting patterns. So the commuting patterns for Burlington actually have gotten bigger. When we looked at the 2000 census, uh, Swanton wasn't part of the Burlington, South Burlington labor market area. By 2010, it was part of it because there's more commuting coming from north. Um, and so anyone who goes by, um, the interstate exit outside Burlington around five o'clock, you can see the traffic heading north. Which is like my, my Ferrisburg is mm -hmm. so the top part of Ferrisburg is. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, so where this information gets interesting and um, uh, new is as, you know, for a while this story wasn't so interesting because it was an economic recovery, but this data is based on monthly estimates. We create monthly estimates of what the jobs are in the state of Vermont. And then after we do a year's worth of estimates, this is just shorthand, if anyone's interested in the technical details, I can go back and explain it. But after a year's worth of monthly estimates, we go back and true it up and say, how did we do? So that we can kind of baseline where we start off for our next 12 months of estimates. And then we come back and say, how did we do? And so where this story is, is if we separate the state of Vermont into two parts, the Burlington labor market area or the rest of the state, which is the balance, everything from south to central to the northeast kingdom, you get the purple line and the red line, and you can see where the economic growth has happened. And within a short period of time, Burlington was back to where it was in 2007 and beyond. And so this is positive economic growth, meaning jobs, um, in the Burlington labor market area that had significant rate of growth over time. This is what's, the red line represents what's happening in the balance of the state. When we, we were producing estimates last year that actually showed that this part of the state had recovered, and that Burlington was continuing to grow. When we just completed, this is new information, we're still digesting it because we had to complete it in February and released it in March. When we actually went back and looked at what happened in those 12 months, we realized we were overestimating in both those areas. We, meaning the US Department of Labor, the Bureau of Labor Statistics. Vermont is a partner to them, but we have little control over the estimates. They, they come out of DC and they, see the, they say, we don't like them, they say tough. You know? So uh, <laughs> what happened is this revision down pushed the balance of the state to a point where they're not even back to where they were in 2007. Plus, you see that sharp decline in the Burlington labor market area where it's like, shoo, we're now seeing an over the year job loss in Burlington by about 1,200 jobs. And when I talk about this economic recovery, if you've heard me talk anytime since 2010 forward, when I talk about the economic recovery, I talk about the national storyline that this is an urban-based economic expansion. Across the country, it has been urban centers that have been experiencing all the job growth. It is the big cities, and that has been no different in the state of Vermont, where our big metropolitan area has been significantly growing. And so where this is where I'm currently up all night thinking about things like this and what the Vermont economy is up to, is that if our biggest urban center, after going through this annual revision, we thought we were growing and now we're not growing over the year. What does that mean for the overall health? And so when I look at uh, the state, we are a small state subject to the winds of the US economy. And what's interesting to note, in the last recession, Vermont actually started showing economic downturns about three to six months before the US yes. did. So when I start, I'm a bit of a recession hawk too. So like, you know, it's the fun of my job is you're like, when, when's it gonna happen? When's it gonna switch? So I'm not saying it's gonna happen today or we're in a recession or three months or six months or maybe even a year or two years. We don't know where it's gonna go. There, this could be a plateau. Um, it could be uh, the data could revise again. Most likely it will revise significantly to move it back positive. But um, there could be more fuel for this economic fire. We just don't know where it's gonna come from yet. You've answered part of my question regarding what does the rest of Vermont look like? And I see we're still down 1%. But now I want to go to a different question. Sure. Do you have any concept of what the driver of that job loss in the Great Burlington area is? That's a great question. Um, and uh, I did pull the data to see, and again, this is all, we're still sorting through this. It's only a couple weeks old, and we're trying to understand it. But it is very broad based, and that was what um, gave me a little bit of pause. So we're seeing declines in manufacturing. We're seeing declines in retail trade. We're seeing declines in professional and technical and business services. Um, and those are the primary drivers of the decline in Burlington, Could labor it, market area. So is it that 
because we don't have people to fill the jobs, the jobs are being moved elsewhere, or or are the jobs the the jobs being automated, or or some of both? Or? Yeah, that's a great po uh, uh, point, and the commissioner raises that point frequently. Is that these are account of heads, you know, people employed. It is possible that uh, employers are trying to hire. They could have 5,000 open jobs in Burlington labor market area, and they can't fill them. And as a result of just natural churn, they actually have a down. But yes, so that it could be show here. No, these are just uh, employee counts as reported by employers. So it doesn't speak to how many open jobs there are. But we do believe that with Burlington being, like, uh, I believe, the tied for seventh lowest unemployment rate for all metropolitan areas across the country, tied for seventh, which is pretty low. Of, I think they <coughs> track 250 or something. Um, we do know that there is a tight labor market. And so some of it could be just lots of jobs opening. Yeah, unfilled. Laurie? Matt, four years ago when I was on Commerce and you came and presented that, and this is four years ago, you were anticipating a recession. Or you said we were overdue. I want you to mm. say you, we oh, were overdue. Yeah. You weren't anticipating, but you said we were overdue. So that was four years ago. And coupled with your statement that with the last big one we had, Vermont was three to six months ahead of that, what's your, are we heading, in your best professional um, opinion, for a recession? Um, that is a great question. Um, so the, the back story of the initial uh, testimony that I provided is that typically a business cycle um, goes seven, eight years, right? And so we're talking since 2007, a business cycle includes both the up and the down. So if we were looking at this business cycle, we're already at 10 years because 2007 was the high point, And if we have already have a trough, now we're looking for a peak, we're plus 10 years out. So we're anywhere from two to three to four years past what an average business cycle is. This is already, I believe, the second longest economic expansion in US history. Um, so, but then the old adage comes, you know, first and foremost, economists have uh, success, what is it? Economists have predict. What is it? I, I tried to get this joke before I came in here. What is it? Uh, <laughs> economists have. What is it? There are a few jokes uh, about economists. I know. That's uh, not. Yeah. Oh gosh. No, no, but far more like life. Yeah, I know. a joke. Yeah. Uh, no, it's um. It's something that is that they've made 15 correct predictions about the last three recessions. You know, something like that, where you know, or 100 percent of the time we're able to tell you when a recession happened in the past. <laughs> something like that. Um, we're not, you know, that's where I really hold my line as an economist. As I'm here to provide information, I can't give you an opinion because as soon as I do, I, re I I'm outside my bounds. The, um, if, if we make it to 19, I believe then we'll hit the longest period of growth. But our growth hasn't been stellar. It's been, it's been constant and slow, but nothing like, mm -hmm. you know, to yeah. knock your socks off. Right. And and so, um, there probably will be a correction. But as you said, nobody can really determine when that correction will be. And there's yeah, signs that we can be looking for. Yeah. Um, and so even the last three recessions, they've been getting farther apart, but they've been taking longer recoveries. So we're actually kind of consistent with how since the 1990, the 2001, and the 2007 recessions have looked. Um, they've, it's just mm -hmm. slower recovery, longer durations between um, downturns. Um, and I think that's the, the interesting part about this is um, no one, when, I even when I ask national economists, I say, what is the risks of this current economy from a US perspective? And a typical answer I get from many is, well, there's international risks and there's domestic risks. <laughs> and that's the yeah, end of the okay. quote. I go, well, thank you. But that doesn't help me much. I'm like, where, you know, I, you know, we can point to high stock market prices. We can point to a lot of debt, potentially. But like how this all unfolds or how it all puts together in terms of some sort of lighting the match towards an, a, you know, an economic downturn, I don't know. And that's the, the interesting part of how does it how does it go forward? Because no one can really see where the structural weaknesses are right now. It, you know, certainly discussions about international entanglements, whether uh, military or uh, economic, um, you know, that adds question marks. Mary had a question in the bottom. Can you talk to us about what's happening in the okay. rest of Vermont? So the, what the economy is looking like, what the jobs are, and if you can talk about it regionally, if you can break it out. 
that way? I would, um, I can do a little bit off the cuff right now, but I do not have sufficient information to give you a detailed picture on that. But what we do here, and we've been hearing from, um, you know, employers across the state, not just Burlington labor market area, but employers are trying to hire and they're finding, um, you know, a limited number of applicants. And so there are employers that are trying to grow in, in other parts of the state and they're just not successful in the recruitment or retention. Um, you know, the census numbers, the inner between the 10 year census, the numbers for Vermont are always a little squishy in my mind, um, but there are showing some significant declines in certain counties. There was recently an article saying how many counties in the, that it showed population loss, and, um, and that certainly puts a um, downward pressure on economic growth, traditional economic growth is yeah. population loss. But when it, you, it's the employers, the, you know, it's everything from medical to construction. The Vermont Department of Labor just had a, a very large um, job fair specifically related to construction and we had 30 plus employers um, saying we're hiring right now, looking for people for the season, um, but it's also leisure and hospitality. It's professional and business and technical services. Um, Vermont is a very balanced economy and we're not seeing any a particular um, one area that's not feeling the pressure of this constricted labor market. So Business, leisure, what was it? You said a third. Um, oh, construction. Construction mm -hmm. and manufacturing so, and healthcare. Okay. Yeah, right. I mean, it's really so broad based. Not um, land based, not agricultural or, mm. or value added agricultural sort of work. Um, the uh, Vermont Department of Labor, our ability to see data is really uh, based on the federal laws associated with unemployment insurance and agriculture falls, a lot of agriculture falls outside of our ability to see. So I'm not even the best to answer about how agriculture is reacting to this current situation. Bob and then Kathy? Oh, I'm all set. I kind of got it. Okay, Kathy? What about the uncertainty in trade? Mm. Um, I'm really worried because we do have a significant amount of trade, not as much as we used to, but I'm wondering how that's affecting our labor market here. Are people hesitant to hire because they don't know if they can get their goods out? Or um, I'm not sure. I, I, that's a great question. I, I don't know the answer to that. I don't think... Um, I'm not seeing so much of a hesitancy of employers to hire. It's actually um, a lack of the skills that they're looking for. Um, so that you know, employers are really saying, you know, this is a good economic climate for us right now. We're trying to either backfill um, people who are retiring or typical job churn, um, or they're trying to say we're growing, we're trying to grow, and we're having we're reaching um, barriers associated with labor supply. We hear that a lot. Which is, you know, one of the reasons I think the department is trying to focus with a lot with young people and people who are currently outside the labor force to say, how can we bring people into the labor force? How can we retain youth? How can we educate youth about the employment opportunities that are available right now for the skills they have? Because many employers have, um, you know, it seemed like during the recession, employers raised the bar and the criteria they were looking for for employees because when they put out an application, they would get 100 and they wouldn't want to sort. So they said, well, let's move up uh, what we're looking for. And now I think we're finally starting to see them go down, where they say, we just need someone to show up on time, work well with others, and we can train the rest. Mm -hmm. And we're really, more engagement regarding apprenticeships, more engagement regarding training programs, more engagement even in the high school levels, saying, let's work with you to figure out what people are going to be doing post-graduation, and how can we get them right into an employment opportunity here in Vermont. But how are we keeping people here when our wages are less than they are, say, in Boston or some of these places? Um, the wage question is a difficult one for me because when I look at like income statistics, you know, Vermont, from an income standpoint, we're in the top half for the country. Um, our median wage is typically higher than the national, but our average wage is lower. Uh, and a lot of that has to do with our industry structure here. We don't have like the big corporate headquarters or the big financiers. And so um, there are certain occupations we can't compete with Boston. If you're solely looking at a dollar for dollar paycheck, 
you know, yeah. IT infrastructure. Oh, sorry, I have actually copies that do.
they're not, they're not complementary, they're substitutes, as opposed to the wage increases that we're seeing and where the people are actually getting um, returns on education, return on skills, it's because they're complementary to the technological advances. Mm -hmm. And so we have concerns about that. So I'm interpreting or inferring from that statement that um, people who are hovering around the minimum wage level are not likely to see their wages being pulled up by whatever they can do to increase their value just because of the market that they're living in. Right. If, if they were in a different market, uh, then, then they'd be able to, and by market I mean job skills and, yep. and ability to. Okay. Yep, like occupational family. Oh, yeah. And so they have to go, if you are a low-skilled low worker, you have to go through the traditional way of like increasing your skills, increasing your tenure, increasing your value for your company, and demonstrating success and rising through the ranks. Um, and uh, and so it is. It's a challenge. And so when we talk, when you were saying increase wages, I think about wages on an annual basis, not an hourly basis. Mm -hmm. So even though you know there has been, um, if you can yeah. increase someone's yeah. um, hourly earnings, it doesn't necessarily translate into annual increases because we even have two different data sources that are pointing to the fact that hours are being cut. Mm -hmm. um, and so, pri um, a survey from private employers saying how much does, in the private sector, how much do you imply, private sector employees work? They've gone down 3% over the last six years. Mm -hmm. So that's a 3% cut in hours. And I would, I would bet dollars to donuts that those decrease in hours are disproportionately felt by lower skilled workers. Mm -hmm. um, in addition, when you go to a household survey, now we're not talking businesses, we're talking to households, we're talking to Vermonters, and we say, what's your work situation? And some people are saying part-time. And you're saying, would you take more hours if you could accept more hours? And they'd say yes. And so there's this cross pressure that we're getting from two surveys saying there are workers out there who would like more hours, but because of economic reasons, they're not getting the offer to have more hours. And then it becomes a question of, well, why is that? And unfortunately, we don't have that. That's where the survey ends, unfortunately. So could you do kind of a similar math or chart for Wages and holding constant in some, you know, in eighteen dollars and showing us the wage trend. Sure. Maybe. Yeah, it would be. I could do it by county if that's helpful. Yeah. Um, and but it would be only yeah. averages. Yeah. It would only be averages. Yeah. So again, you'd have that high uh, yeah. wage could, problem. You can't year. do it by quintiles. Not to that level of detail. Yeah. Um, we're still trying to break down the Vermont economy, even in quintiles as it is. And it, it presents um, analytical challenges yeah. about we how you do that. small, too. I, I no, uh, not for yeah. the whole state. Yeah. We're looking at about 500,000 records well, a year. But I was thinking, but if you did it by county, you mm -hmm. know, oh, yeah. then, then it's... Yeah, it, it does start breaking down, but even for, as long as you were, yeah, Essex County or yeah. Grand Isle would be. Yeah. The others that, okay. that would be interesting. If, yeah. you, could, if sure. you could put I it into that. constant dollars, that would be, yeah. Okay, Bob, Matt, Kathy. Um, I don't know just how to word this, but so do you, you've got these little spiky little ups and downs, but then you got some more rolly ones, mm -hmm. ones. I guess my question is, is, do you monitor or try to, in any way, the effect of what this building does one way or the other and how it might show up here? Is that? Um, that is a good question. I've had a similar question before, and um, yeah, the. I don't know how to go about that. You know, there's there can be um, with the complexities associated with the economy, like there have to be a significant change. Like, for example, the if you look at these jagged lines, if you look at the blue line, there is a spike in the U.S. Um, towards. Well, we're not here anymore, but um, where the blue line was, and there's this like little uh, bump. That's the 2010 oh. census. In the uh, yeah. you see that little oh. yeah. And the, the smaller the geography, geography, the more jagged it's going to be. So even like the blue line's pretty smooth, Vermont is okay smooth, but then the red and um, purple lines are more jagged. 
Um, oh. There's variations. And so some of this stuff is it's like, it could be either just sample noise or it could be um, seasonal patterns. Like I'm looking at say, you know, um, late oh, yeah. summer 2016, there seemed to be something going on in rural Vermont and Burlington that get, no, actually everybody, a little, yeah, it's like a little bump. Yep. And I don't yeah. know. It's interesting to think about what what could what that do we be? do. What yeah. do we do? Twenty fifteen. Yeah. I don't know. <laughs> Maybe we didn't do nothing. The summer so of the sixteen economy did well. <laughs> well, we stabilized the mineral. It was a campaign in summer. <laughs> was that fifteen? Is it sixteen? Oh, I think it was like four. Then. When we put in the automatic indexing for. Hmm. Okay, well. Matt, your question was answered. Bob asked my question. Okay, Kathy? My question was answered because I'm with the seasonal effect of the interest. Can we, are you going to go to this question? Sure. And I keep going back to my same question, so I just want to make sure everyone hears it. <laughs> When I, when I read through A through E, mm -hmm. it, it appears that we better start dovetailing education with labor. Because when you look at the unskilled labor and the demands there, and the demands for more skilled labor that are higher salary and we don't have the people to fill it, are we looking at education and looking at labor and doing this? And I don't think we've done it in 200 years. <clears throat> and if we don't start doing it, we're not going to turn anything around. So tell me, what are you thinking? And uh, you know, how do we how do we address education so it benefits what we need for workers? Mm -hmm. We talk about it, but we don't do anything. Um. Am I yes. Uh, no, I, I was trying to think if there was a question I was supposed to answer in there or just a statement. I guess it was a statement, but uh, is, is my statement wrong? I mean, do we have to start dovetailing education and labor and with uh, being prepared for our labor markets, or are our labor markets changing so, so fast, fast that we just keep education the same and it's down here and we're not preparing kids for what the jobs that they need to be prepared for? Um, it's, a, it's a fair question. And first, thank you for entertaining this um, graph, and it's completely not to scale, and it's something that I kind of came up with having worked on a, a federal committee that I just I thought it needed to be shared or at least visualized, what I call the cello diagram. Um, where um, you know we do have a, a population in the top half of the cello where there is a, a good part population that is getting educated but in some instances you look at the people in category B they're getting educated in ways that aren't transferable directly to the labor market and they potentially could be graduating with a significant amount of debt mm -hmm. um, and then wondering how did I get here mm -hmm. um, and in addition, what I think you're pointing to is C, is that when you know, the department looks and has conversations with employers, we look at our apprenticeship program, which has you know, guaranteed employment at the end of this program, and we say, we can't fill them fast enough, those apprenticeship spots. And how is it that you know, people are graduating from high school and then say, I don't know what I'm gonna do, and then they you know, you know, kind of meander along. And so I think it has been a big passion of mine and the departments to focus on career awareness and getting out in the communities um, to talk to young people in any place that will invite us. So we've tried to do a grassroots approach because we are so small. Um, but um, I think the point I look at is E, as it relates to this graph, is that the individuals who are unemployable at this point. They have low skills. The, the, you know, and this goes, I think, to your point about education, is that high school, people without a high school graduate, the, 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 um, the employment outcomes, the labor force outcomes are just really poor, um, you know, like something in the order of 30% are even potentially in the labor force, so you're losing a big part of them. So if you don't graduate high school, there's little chance that you're going to be going on into employment. Um, but, uh, you know, in the, I've had this discussion because I am married to an educator, and so I can't, you know, I've heard, we've had this discussion about what's education's role, what's labor's role, and how do they come together. It's a philosophical. Mm -hmm. Do you see the approach. Department of Labor and the Agency of Education having conversations, or are we still siloed in the state? Uh, because of WIOA, um, the Workforce in uh, Investment Opportunity Act, our federal mm -hmm. partners have said, you guys are going to work together whether you like it or not. And so there's actually been an incredible amount of partnership over the last few years. Um, talking to, we work very closely with the Career Technical Education mm -hmm. uh, individuals, CTEs. 
Um, but you know, public education has their plate full. Just speaking from my wife's perspective, they have their plate full trying to figure out how they're going to um, handle. Yeah, we have CTEs coming in. Obviously, uh, we're, we're understanding mm -hmm. they're underutilized, and yep. the kids don't access them. And and so we'll hear from that as well. I, I just am really concerned that we have this old model of education that that isn't keeping that it's way out of pace. And um, you know, even though we have these types of training programs or some things that are underutilized, you know, it's almost like we need to. <laughs> yeah, be careful. Yeah, no, I, I, <laughs> but Peter has a question, and then Maureen and. and so this is. Uh, I definitely want to dove, dovetail in on on this because I was talking to uh, Maureen yesterday about this. In that, we, as Kitty has said, we have an old model of education that requires an individual to obtain 26 credits to be able to graduate high school, but you cannot put credits that you obtain in CTE into those 26 credits. Mm -hmm. And so are we disincentivizing individuals to, to maybe go into CTE and get some things that would really help them uh, by doing that? And you're not going to be able to answer that. That's OK. But what I want to know is, what do you mean by skill when it comes to, uh, to, to the chart that you've got up there? And what do you mean by education when it comes to the chart that you have up there? Because that help would help to inform the conversation that I that I want to have about CTE and and schools still, essentially a hundred years ago they're getting what they you know it, yeah it's, it's new courses, but it's the same thing you got to have X number of credits to graduate. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think when I talk about skill, and I will just point out quickly that skill is uh, highly correlated with wage, so you could almost look at this as a wage scale as well. And that's why the, um, the red pyramid being the, the labor demand, the one thing you're not going to change about a capitalist economy is there's going to be one person at the top. They're going to have a close net of you know, upper management. Then you have middle management. And your professionals are probably in the middle. But then you have frontline production staff. And those frontline production staff are always going to outnumber the people at the top. right? And so your opportunity is to make sure that um, individuals are um, skilled and um, able to work in the positions that are in demand. I think when I talk about skill, it can be anything from formal education to informal education. You grew up on a farm, I bet you have a ton of skills. You might be able to stick weld, who knows? And it's those type of skills. It doesn't have to be demonstrated in any for, uh, form of a official capacity, but you have to be able to demonstrate it in a way to an employer. Um, so when I talk to young pe parents of young people who are very skilled in, say, graphic design, I say, and they're talking about which college should I go to, I was like, for graphic design, you might not even be thinking college because what you're thinking about is a portfolio approach. You have to demonstrate you have the skills and therefore putting out a portfolio. But if your skills are not you know, suitable for developing a portfolio, how do you go about that? Through certification, through career technical education, through um, other signaling effects like high school or adult technical education as well. Um, so you, there's got to be a way that you can demonstrate it. And so when I talk to young people, I talk about articulating their skills. It's actually, in some ways, the deficiency might not be that the people graduating don't have the skills and demands. They can't or convince someone else they have it because they don't have the ability to articulate that I can show up on time, I can work well with others. And that's going to be the message I bring to Bennington on Monday. It's going to be the message I bring to Castleton on Saturday. What are your skills and be able to say them clearly? Okay, so then as a follow-up, we talk about the education piece. Um, and sending everybody to college may not be the best option for what our economy needs now or certainly into the future. Uh, I'd like you to comment on that, but also, and I'm trying to figure out how to just, just say this question, um, individuals who graduate from college with degrees that we've heard about are seemingly not useful. Are they considered educated, or you know, how how are we looking at them? Mm -hmm. um, those in that this graph that are represented by B, they're people outside. They have skills, a high level of skills, but they're outside the demand of what the look workforce is looking for, or the labor force is looking for. So potentially, you have a PhD in philosophy. If you are not a professional philosopher or an instructor <laughs> of philosophy at the collegiate level, maybe a PhD in philosophy is not going to you know translate into marketable skills. Um, yeah, and you know, Department of Labor believes that post-secondary education is very important. But post-secondary education is a broad swath that would include apprenticeships, that would include uh, technical education, that would include on-the-job trainings. It would not necessarily be a four-year degree. Um, it couldn't be a two-year degree. Uh, so final, final question, comment. Is there a better term than 
education as it pertains to post-secondary education? Because everyone, you say post-secondary education, everyone thinks college. Yeah, we, I, when we placed our bet a couple of years ago on this, we just said we're going to start making sure when we say post-secondary education, we explain, use the caveat, we're not talking about four-year degrees. We're talking about the spectrum of post-secondary education. You're right, maybe a better term would be a, a way to help in that conversation. Uh, well, my political science degree got me here. <laughs> there you go. I, I, I'm, I'm using it. You're uh, making the big bucks. <laughs> You're making the big bucks, right? <laughs> um, but there's, in terms of education and, and labor, there is no, and most, many of us are teachers or been on school board, there is no system with more inertia than the education system. You, to make a change in curriculum, to make a change, at the bottom. you know, yeah, I mean, it is impossible. It is a, we live in a state with 630,000 people. We can't even have a statewide schedule. I mean, we can't even get our kids off school at the same time. It's so control. Yeah, well, but I'm saying it's it it's an inertia. It it's it, to Kitty's point, it hasn't changed in 200, 200 Not years, right? You know, um, we're still married to the schedule that you know people have to go home and work on the farms. And anyway, I'll, but it, it's it's to get education to change is a bigger challenge, I think, than expanding on labor and what definitions of higher education, you know, is. And, and I look at um, some of the private schools, like a Champlain College, they turn on a dime when they know that there's a demand in the area for certain schools. They get a curriculum, and they get people in there, and they turn out these, these people. But the public school system is just, it's just, you can't move it. So I think it needs to have some more of these external factors with labor and, and that sort of thing. And Thanks, that's my, um, <laughs> you know, that's, that's my it's sermon real. today. Diane? So sort of on, so here's where I come at this. It's really good that we can match up to make sure that children who are getting, that are going through our system have the skills that when they step out the door that they can get the job that they're looking for, that they plan for. But one of the things that I worry about is our children are not widgets. They are not something that we're trying to mass produce out the door to fit a corporate driven industry that we're trying to form fit them. I worry about the artist who's not being developed because we need scientists or STEM, which is good if you like STEM. And um, so here's, here's my question on that, or what brought me to this is that historically, and I, I know you do a lot of work and you're so good at your job, thank you. <laughs> but I don't know if this is your, but historically, like I think 50 years ago, 30 years, 50 years ago, even, you know, my father's generation, the, the, um, the GI Bill of Rights changed the face of this country with education for when, after World War II. And it allowed industry to grow as strong as it did because they could come home, they got to work, they got jobs where you could buy a house and have a family and send your kids to school. And I think we're almost back to there again. But there was a significant population that did not graduate, that it wasn't, it wasn't where they were at, you know, that didn't finish high school, but still were able to make a living. I don't know if we have data. Has the percentage of, this one, has the percentage of the group of people not finishing high school or going into school changed over time? Has it historically been 30%? This isn't where you go, but they could find a niche in the world because they could work <coughs> on a farm, they could work in a factory, but those jobs aren't there anymore. So now that same percentage is really stuck. So that would be my question, is like, has, what's, is, has it changed? Or is it just because yes. the skills that it takes to live in this world have changed and now people who don't fit that mold are struggling? Yeah, I think That's a long uh, to your first part of the question, uh, educational attainment has improved. And so more people are graduating high school than before. Um, so it is a smaller share. I don't even know the number off the top of my head. There's a small population of people in Vermont that have not graduated high school. As I said, their employment outcomes are very, very low. 
-hmm. If you wanted to see that data, I could certainly provide no, it. Yeah. Um, but before, there were opportunities, uh, you know, to m move from one area into, you know, if you didn't graduate high school, sometimes it was out of economic necessity to help the family because you were leaving high school because you knew there was employment and you would go seek that employment. Yeah. But as you mentioned, there, um, you know, manufacturing, for example, um, is, um, it has changed. Um, so that um, it's a different skill set they're looking for, right? And so it's not just someone who can show up on time and stand at attention at this particular part of the production line. That person might be able to have to troubleshoot, have to be able to read complicated, critical thinking, yeah, yeah, critical thinking, yeah. Um, be able to understand complicated decimals and understand, you know, very, very precise ma machinery. Maybe to your point, and this is a conversation I've had with Georgetown University, who is, puts out a ton of material about um, the importance of post-secondary education. Typically, they're talking about college, um, um, and they talk about how you know, the skills of the future and how the Bureau of Labor Statistics has it all wrong, and that this pyramid is all wrong, basically, and that we need, 70% of the people need to have post-secondary education, mm -hmm. not um, one-third, which is what the Bureau of Labor Statistics says. And, and I've had conversations with them about that. I said, well, what is it about, um, you know, I said, if you wanted to be an auto mechanic, um, you know, is it that, 12 years isn't enough, and that you need 16 years of school, or is it that, this, the, that within those 12 years, you need to change what you're looking at and how you're learning, and it's not the duration of education that's important, it's the content of the education that's important. And so Georgetown didn't have an answer for me on that, because, you know, but the, the truth is somewhere in the middle. Bureau of Labor Statistics clearly states this is a minimum entry requirement that, um, one third of all jobs need something with post-secondary education and most just need high school education. And Georgetown looks at educational attainment and captures the, the top of the cello and says it must be necessary. So I'll just so this is why I'm so strong on the after school experience. That mm -hmm. You got your core education piece, your reading, writing, arithmetic, but that after school experiencing, exploring, welding, knitting, cooking, that allows people to, or students, to be able to have a feel or a flavor for something that they can now start to focus in within that 12 years yeah. mm -hmm. that they're within that system. So before yeah. you leave in 10 minutes, I want to make sure we go back to the reason that we have you here. Okay. Because <laughs> um, we like this. I, I wanted, um, we, we are discussing the minimum wage, and you brought in some economic indi indicators. And so if you could provide us with uh, just a quick summary of um, what the, uh, there's a bill out there that would increase the minimum wage to $15 an hour over X by 2024. 2024. If you could weigh in on um, the factors that we should consider. But I do have a statement because I can't hold it back. Um, my statement, then Bob and Mary had a question after you, after you bring us back on track. I, I, I'm just wondering, after I s sat and listened to this conversation, sometimes when you pick colleges, you know, I, I keep thinking of Northeastern in, in Boston, you know, they do that five-year program and they hammer, they hammer. 98% of our kids have jobs or, you know, or X percent go on for their master's degrees. I wonder if we should do that with our high schools. You know, what percent are going on to higher education? What percent are going on to training for, you know, electrician, plumbing? Yeah, I mean, those are real professions. Um, and, and, you know, to get an idea, are we keeping pace with, with what the, the labor needs idea. are? You know, all we measure is our high school graduation rate. Mm -hmm. And, you know, is our graduation rate giving us the information we need to make important decisions to have kids ready for the labor market. Mm -hmm. And, and I, I'm, I would be, it would, I'm curious if we measured it like colleges do to entice kids to come. If you come here, you have a 98% chance of having a job. Well, I'm thinking, well, two out of 100, I might have a job, I might as well go. You know, it just, I, I know that's simplifying it and I'm getting a glare from Mary. <laughs> but I just wonder if we're measuring the right things that give us the information to move forward. But can you please go back to our minimum wage? Sure. And, um, and, and then, so I'll just start here and then we'll kind of pivot. And so again, I'm, I'm not politically appointed. I don't have a political opinion. And what I'm just trying to, I was, 
uh, assigned to represent the Department of Labor on the Summer Study Committee for the minimum wage. Unfortunately, I didn't have an opportunity to participate because they had such a full schedule, but I was witness to the conversation. Um, as a result of witnessing the conversation, seeing the, the work that the committee did, my questions, uh, they did a lot of great work, but I think there was one question that was not asked. And so again, I'm just here to provide information to help you make a decision. Um, there seemed to be a tremendous amount of focus about what will happen. If we do this, what will happen? And my question was, we've raised the minimum wage four times in the last four years. What has happened? And this led me down the hole of realizing that part-time employment has increased um, for economic reasons, meaning people want more work, that private employers are decreasing the number of hours worked, and we've already talked about that. It caused me to look at this diagram differently because if this diagram, if we accept it um, for what it is, that the red is labor supply, or excuse me, labor demand, and the beige is labor supply, the minimum wage represents this bottom line. And what we're doing is raising it. And so from the Department of Labor standpoint, because our focus is both on employers and employees, anyone who wants to come in the door and get, receive assistance from the Department of Labor, Department of Labor's concern is that population E. People who aren't even employed at $10.50 an hour, how are they going to be employed at $15 an hour? So our concern, um, or my concern as an economist is like, this is one, there's the spirit behind, I think, the move in the minimum wage is clear and everyone would agree. We'd love to see better outcomes for all Vermonters. The challenges associated with that is that the poverty statistics, as we've seen, um, have not looked positive in the last year. They've gone up. Um, when the minimum wage increased, the poverty, poverty statistics went up. When we look at wage inequality across the country, um, there doesn't seem to be any correlation with minimum wage. Um, the statistic that Art Wolf was quoted on VPR is saying is that 50% of people who live under the federal poverty level, limit don't have any income at all, like no wage income. So changing the minimum wage would not help 50% of the people living in poverty. <clears throat> so this could be a strategy to help individuals who have employment and um, um, and the companies that will be best adapt to, uh, to handle a change in minimum wage, which typically be larger employers, but there's got to be a strategy to assist the others because that population is going to increase um, because it's going to improve or it's going to increase the um, return on investment associated with things like technology. It's going to change the business dynamics. Um, and so that, that's the short, you know, just kind of, uh, and the other thing I would just say is that, you know, I've, an economist for 13 years, and one of the things that's most studied and less, the, with the fewest amount of conclusions is minimum wage, about what it does and who it helps and who it doesn't help. Mm -hmm. And so in 13 years, like for example, traditional economic theory would say, if minimum wage is going up, labor force participation rate would go up. And that's not what we've seen. We haven't seen labor force participation go up. We haven't seen any young people go up. If, if best, it's flat. Um, at worst, it's going down. So there's some indications to me of saying we don't, I don't have a clear understanding of what minimum wage does mm -hmm. relative to the economy once all the intended and unintended consequences triple, triple through. So again, the concern is annual income in my book, not hourly income. So we gotta figure out, are people, what has happened? Have we, has the, the benefits been realized? Have there been a savings to the state government for state, uh, state services? Have there been an increase in annual wages? Um, and these are some of the questions that just haven't been explored or answered. Uh, Mary, Matt, Kathy, and then Bob, you had a question too, right? So, Neil, everybody. Running somewhere, so. Yeah. We, Actually, so, it's Mary, Bob, Matt, Kathy. Okay, go ahead. Yesterday, we were talking about the inability to understand the consequence of minimum wage increases in the past. And is it our. Are we unable, or have we just not studied enough to see what has happened in the past? I think both. Uh, at least in this last go around, we haven't asked what has happened in these last four or five years. We haven't asked. We haven't asked, and so no one's and looked so at it. What are the things that we ought to be looking at there? Well, those things I mentioned, labor force participation okay. rate, so whole, annual yeah, earnings. Yeah, yeah. Um, um, but as I said, unfortunately, with the reduction in hours, that, that yeah. puts a hamper on it. It's not an unknowable question. It would just have not it, looked at it. It's, some of it is tough because we can't figure out who the minimum wage earners are and what their household circumstances are such to determine are these individuals better off. 
Okay. We're, that's why we look at people who are working part-time for economic reasons as opposed to part-time for non-economic reasons, mm -hmm. um, which is you know, kind of the, a, a very dirty way of trying to determine part-time by choice and part-time mm -hmm. by um, not choice. Interesting. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Bob? Yeah, mine's just a brief one. You said earlier that you're going to Castleton on Saturday. Yes. What are you doing there? Yeah, VSAC has been putting on um, uh, seminars uh, for students. They've done three, so I've done St. Mike's and Johnson. And what they're doing is inviting any uh, students or parents in the neighborhood to come and learn, and they put together workshops. And uh, one of the strain of workshops is related to employment and career awareness. Um, some of them are related to social life in college, how to pay for college, other things like that. So I'll be there do talking you, about career do awareness. Do you run this thing kind of thing past? Them? No. 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 We will keep it high end. We'll talk about skills. We'll talk about careers. And we'll talk about how education translates. Um, how education translates into skill. And skill translates into wages. Okay. No. Thank you. Uh, Matt and then Kathy and then we need yeah. to let that go. Just a clarification. Oh, we're almost matching. I just a little. Yeah. Mine's great. I said more. <laughs> 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 I'm just confused by the statement you made in the beginning to sort of frame everything. So you said you're not a political appointee. And typically, when we have the political appointees in, they have to sort of walk the administration line, which we know is not positive on this particular legislation. So was your, were you saying that just to let us know that what you're telling us is your opinion separate from the administration and um, not influenced by the direction that the administration um, and the Department of Labor as a whole has gone with this. This uh, is your opinion as an economist. Was that why you made that statement? Yeah, thank you for clarifying. Um, you're correct that if the administration has an opinion, um, they would share it with you directly. Um, hopefully, I have shared no opinions with you. That's my goal. If right. you've heard an opinion, then please uh, allow me an opportunity <laughs> no, to no. clarify. What I'm just saying is that I've heard the conversation. So typically in a conversation about public policy, I would come in and say, on one hand, you have this, and on the other hand, you have this. But having been witness to the conversation of minimum wage, I'm hearing things that haven't been discussed. So if you want to talk about um, what has been done or the reports or people's opinions about what has, they will have, they can fill in all the gaps. This is the conversation I haven't heard anyone ask. Has anyone looked at labor force participation rates? Has anyone looked at hours worked? Had anyone, has anyone looked at uh, annual earnings. Uh, I, I didn't yeah. mean to imply that oh, no, I heard no. an opinion from you. It yeah. was more, um, I think, when Clarity. when we're hearing um, things from, an from you know the administration or from this group or that group, mm -hmm. they sort of get put in a box of, well, this group is for it or this group is against it, and just putting into the perspective of where you're coming from yeah. with it, and sort of a neutral opinion giving information is helpful. Yeah. Um, and you, you talked with Mary a little bit about um, <laughs> about the lack of information uh, regarding the minimum wage. Has there been any um, data that's substantial enough for that you've been able to look at from places that have raised the minimum wage to $15 an hour to give any indication of what that has meant in those areas? Or is that just an area that's not enough information out there yet? When I look at the body of research, and I'm not a minimum wage expert, but I've looked at enough of it, the, the, the people who do the research typically fall in a couple of camps, and normally they're either advocates saying that you know we're either for or against this, and you know I would say it's probably like 80-20 on people for minimum wage versus against minimum wage who are doing studies, and then you have a smaller group of people who are trying to do independent research. But like so, the Washington studies, there's a couple of big ones I know people talk about. The only one I put really stock in is the one that was conducted by the National Bureau of Economic Research. Um, and they came up with inconclusive at best or potentially harmful because of decreased hours. Okay. Thank you. Uh, Kathy, and then. I didn't really have this. a question, but oh. I had a statement. Well, you know, I've and been giving mine, so you yeah. go right up. <laughs> <laughs> and I love having Matt come in because I think he tells it like it is. Mm -hmm. But I've been in this building long enough so that I know that they're, depending on the makeup of the committee, and it usually is made up with a self-fulfilling prophecy. Mm. And um, probably I'll get darts thrown at me. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> no more than I oh. did. <laughs> oh, um, Matt, you. thank you very much for coming yeah, in. Yeah, this is interesting and, yeah. and helpful and enjoy having you.